volcanoes erupted, depositing a million cubic kilometers of lava. The atmosphere changed as the level of carbon dioxide increased. Ecosystems around the world were ravaged. Mass extinction followed. The most dramatic turn possible in the course of evolution. The Permian extinction was a time when if you were playing Russian roulette and you had a, a gun with 10 chambers in it, you put nine bullets in it, spin it, put it to your head, you've got one chance out of 10 of surviving. In a mass extinction, when species die, they don't die alone. The collapse of one species helps bring down others. You can almost analogize that to a house of cards. Each species props up another, in a sense. Because the creature that you eat is that card that is sitting under you that gives you your energy. Now let's pretend that we start kicking out card after card after card, and that's what a mass extinction does, isn't it? It starts knocking out a species here, knocks out a species there, but pretty soon, lots of species are gone. And it's not just the disappearance of species now, the whole house of cards falls down. You start really snowballing in this effect, and that's really what a mass extinction is. The rocks tell the extraordinary story of what happened next. Above the barren lair, new signs of life. We know that very few animals that were present prior to the extinction here survived it. I just found a carnivorous mammal-like reptile in strata that we have just above the mass extinction. This is a creature that has survived it. The mammal-like reptiles look like crosses between dogs and lizards. But they weren't the only survivors. Two lineages that get through have tremendous consequences later in time. Both are pretty small in size. They start evolving because the world is empty, and empty worlds really begat tremendous amount of evolutionary diversifications. Evidence of what was to come is in one of the best fossil collections of post-extinction survivors gathered by a single family over three generations. Of all the skulls in this museum, this is my favorite. This creature leads to the dinosaurs. At the same time that it exists in the earliest Triassic period, right after the mass extinction, we find a second small carnivore, very different. This little skull is the species that leads to us. Two of these predators, the small mammal, the larger reptilian creature that becomes the dinosaurs, really duke it out in head-to-head -head competition. In the Triassic period, there's a clear winner the dinosaurs. It took around 20 million years for the first dinosaurs to evolve, on their way to the giant creatures we think of today. Dinosaurs get big. They're baroquely diverse with all kinds of weird adaptations, with armor, with predatory animals, with bird-like animals, the dominant animal features of the landscape. Mammals just scurry around in the shadows. Uh, they're, they're small, shrew-like or rat-like in many ways. They look like some of the least dramatic things we have today. Michael Novacek has been fascinated by dinosaurs ever since he learned of a series of expeditions to the Gobi Desert. 
My personal history with the Gobi started a long time ago. I was seven years old. There was this very uh, dramatic explorer, Roy Chapman Andrews, who wanted to go to Central Asia to look for early humans and ended up finding a lot of dinosaurs. He wrote books about it, and kids loved those books, and I was one of those kids. In the 1930s, Roy Chapman Andrews made several trips to the Gobi. Traveling in style, he brought along six motor cars, a team of scientists, and a hundred camels. He didn't find evidence of early humans, but he did find something far more ancient. Buried in the sandstone were 80 million year old dinosaur bones and eggs, and fossils of tiny mammals. Mammals were part of the dramatic finds that the Andrews expedition uncovered. They weren't the biggest things. A lot of these mammals are little nugget-sized creatures. But they were very, very important to science, because at that time, we knew virtually nothing about mammals that old. Mammals so old that they lived alongside of the dinosaurs nearly 100 million years ago. The Gobi Desert is one of the most isolated places in the world. When China reopened it to foreign scientists more than a decade ago, they flooded in. Most, including members of Novacek's team, were looking for dinosaur fossils. The desert had what they wanted. More of those extremely rare dinosaur eggs. But this time, Novacek was after something even rarer. We were actually heading a little west, but en route, our gas tanker got stuck. And so we had to dig it out. And as the truck was being excavated, a few of us took a couple jeeps up to a little hill. And there I saw a mammal skull just lying on the ground. And about every 15 minutes, it seemed, someone said, I got a mammal. And then I'd say, I got one too. We had about 50 mammal skulls by lunchtime. We had already matched the amount that's been recovered from the Gobi entirely over a period of seven decades. This is about as big as they get. This is the skull, and you can see the front teeth here. It's really no larger than a squirrel, or what we would call a small mammal today. It contrasts dramatically with some of the smaller skulls. This encompasses practically the entire size range of mammals during the time of the dinosaurs. Like many of their descendants today, the mammals survived by being nearly invisible. They were nocturnal. They scavenged. They reproduced quickly. Mammals are beginning to get better developed brains. The eyes are becoming larger. And even in the skeleton behind the skull, we see a number of very interesting transitional features. In the pelvic region, there's evidence of splint-like bones that suggest support for the abdominal cavity. And this probably supported a pouch, very much like living marsupials, like opossums and kangaroos a transition between a more primitive egg-laying behavior and a more advanced behavior, a more advanced reproduction that we see in today's placental mammals. 